Okay. Well, I'll say hi to him when I see him. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back in session. Well, welcome back. We're going to uh, impanel our next group. And that will consist of Yulia, Brock, Dodi? Brockdorf. Brockdorf. Okay. Um, Robert Klinger and Catherine Brevik. And Mr. Klinger, I understand you have a doctor's appointment, so yes. we'll make you we'll have you go first. Okay. Thank you. And your name and uh, address for the record, please. Commissioners and committee members, uh, my name is Robert Klinger. I uh, have a small flock of sheep outside of Grand Ronde, Oregon. But I was born and raised in Chicago. And uh, between the time I left Chicago and the time I got to Oregon, I spent nine years at sea. And <clears throat> I see a problem in this room on this issue in that people need to get a better dictionary because there's just a lot of misunderstanding of the words. On the farm, the device is called a clevis. At sea, it's called a shackle. It's the same thing, but if you don't know, you don't know. Now, <clears throat> if the wolf comes into my flock and takes out 22 ewes, he is just as much a chronic predator as the guy that goes into the bar and has 20 beers. I mean, he didn't have to kill 20 sheep. He only needed to kill one, and that would have satisfied him for quite a while. But he killed 20, and, and the 20 sheep didn't gang up on him or try to protect themselves. He was just out there ripping wool and drawing blood. That's just what he does. Okay, now, the, if you'll excuse the expression, wildlifers, they have this feeling of wildlife has to be kept free and we need apex predators to manage the, wild, the, the world outside. Well, <clears throat> on my 85 acres, I am the apex predator. And on Oregon <clears throat> ground, you are the apex predator because you decide what's going to happen and what's not going to happen. Even if it's by negative action, you will cause something. And the wildlifers who think that, I mean, rats, mice, all those guys, they're not, they are wildlife, you know? But they have vector control in the cities to keep them out of, cockroaches out of the restaurants. <clears throat> Why do they get to take advantage of that? And I can't have wildlife services to control the wildlife that's killing my livestock. It's just, it's the same story. It's just looking at it from a different side. And rats and mice are not domestic animals. They're wildlife. So why should they not get just as much protection is the wolf or the cougar or the bear or the bobcat or anything else that's killing my critters. It's within my 85 acres, I am the wild, I am the apex predator living up to the rules that you guys establish. I thank you very much for your time and your efforts and I gotta get going. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, Yulia. 
Thank you. My name is Yulia Bragdorf. I'm from Hillsboro, Oregon. I don't have 85 acres, but I just have 37, and I prefer to cohabit uh, peacefully with the predators on my land. In this, in my case, it is cougars. In any case, Oregon has 137 wolves, and if wolves can be killed after only two livestock predations in nine months, this puts far too many Oregon wolves at risk of being killed. ODFW should instead be focusing its efforts on using non-lethal conflict deterrence measures to prevent conflicts in the first place and to keep them to a minimum. Wiping out wolves is a bad for ecosystem. Wolves keep prey populations healthy and in balance. Since farmers and ranchers are complaining that there are too many deer and elk coming to and on their private lands and eating crops, what a better and more natural solution can there be to the problem than insurance Oregon has healthy, abundant wolf population? 53% of Oregon's land is owned by federal government. Special interest groups and private business owners should not dictate what happens on federal land for the sake of profit and comfort. Farmers' herds are often thousands of animals, and it is their responsibility to protect their private property while using public lands. Robin Browns, the wolf program coordinator, showed data that wolf depredations dropped from 2016 to 17. Representative Barreto believes that a number of wolf depredations go unreported. However, this governing committee cannot disregard empirical data or anecdotal evidence. There is tax credit program and well-defined channels to receive financial reimbursement. Ranchers have clear paths for reporting depredations events in they are compensated for their efforts and their losses, including solely on the grounds of disappearance of the livestock. ODFW staff stated before this commission that justification for this revised plan, and I quote, one of the primary reasons for this is to keep, with, keep up with the workload. This is increasingly cumbersome for staff, even just keeping up with the depredations, making sure the paperwork is accurate and concise and consistent, close quote. They posted that citizens with proper training would be able to hunt and kill wolves. However, citizens with proper training could effectively learn how to cohabit with wolves by using non-lethal conflict deterrence measures to keep losses to a minimum. ODFW should not be certifying people to kill wolves. It should be instead creating statewide comprehensive education program on wolves and how to coexist with them. Public education is identified in wolf plan as high priority. The ODF, um, ODFW should be working at stock and it's part of the wolf plan. Public education is directly needed to combat myths and unjustified fears toward wolves and to keep people, um, to help people understand wolf behavior and biology in wolves' important role in keeping the ecosystem healthy. Please do not approve this plan. There are relatively few wolves in the state. Federal land is property of its citizens. Farmers are already compensated, and the ODFW cannot solve its workload problems with eliminating apex, apex predator, in this case, wolves, critical to our ecosystem. Thank you. Okay. Thank Welcome, you. any questions? Ms. Brevrick. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Catherine Brebick, um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm an Oregon resident, a longtime uh, rural Washington County resident, and a voter. I'm also a wolf advocate. Um, I urge a no vote on this plan. It may be too late for that. You may have decided, but I, I, I want to... Um, talk about uh, a couple things. Um, I really sympathize, of course, with the economic losses of producers, but consider that um, losses of livestock to wolves is under 3% of total livestock in our state. Um, health, weather, birthing, and theft problems are nine times more likely to um, kill cattle and sheep than any predators, including wolves. In addition, I'm discouraged to hear elected officials testifying here today that wolves present a danger to humans. This is um, a historical myth that's factual, factually inaccurate. Um, three items in this revised plan greatly concern me. First, the lack of required documentation of use of non-lethal methods for uh, wolf control by producers. In addition, the authorization of sheriffs and others who may have personal relationships with the producers 
uh, opens the door wide for bias. I oppose the concept and retention of the terms controlled take and controlled hunts in the plan as options for wolf management. This language um, allows for future policy decisions um, that will promote hunting despite the fact that 72% of all Oregonians oppose the killing of wolves. As others more qualified than I um, have testified here today, the best choice for producers and wolf advocates is prevention, including required documentation of non-lethal methods of control. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Our next panel will consist of uh, Danielle Mosier, Sheila Redmond, and Mary Ann Erickson. Welcome, ladies. Danielle, we'll start with you, please. Okay. Uh, Chair Finley, members of the commission, and Deputy Director Hearn. Uh, my name is Danielle Moser. I'm the Wildlife Program Coordinator for Oregon Wild. On behalf of our organization's 20,000 members and supporters, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to provide input on this draft wolf conservation and management plan. Uh, we've submitted written testimony and, and several letters um, which explain in greater detail our concerns with the draft plan and recommendations for fixing it. So with this limited time, I'd like to quickly touch on our three biggest concerns in the plan. Um, but actually, before I do that, I want to clarify one thing, because uh, a few folks have mentioned it in their testimony, and for the commission, and especially for our new commissioners, um, it's been said that wolves were reintroduced here, and I just want the record to show that they were never reintroduced here, so before we begin. Um, so. One, uh, ensuring that meaningful, non-lethal conflict deterrence methods are being implemented before consideration of killing any wolves. In addition to providing resources to livestock operators to effectively use these tools, we urge ODFW, ODA, and other participating entities to continue education on best husbandry practices to reducing conflict. Two, a more defensible standard for chronic depredation. Any chronic depredation standards set forth in this plan should, at a minimum, be contained within one grazing season and pass muster for what is considered chronic. And three, removal of all provisions which allow public de facto hunting and trapping, whether in response to chronic depredation or changes in ungulate populations. As public polling has illustrated, a majority of Oregonians oppose hunting and trapping of wolves. So to be clear, when I say de facto hunting and trapping, I'm talking the general hunt season, I'm talking the controlled hunt season, and I'm talking the controlled take provisions. Because at the end of the day, these all result in the same thing, wolves killed by public citizens. The review of the wolf management plan has provided an important lens, I think, into our Fish and Wildlife Agency's approach to managing species of conservation concern. Um, it's, it was quite clear from the onset of the stakeholder process and subsequent processes that ODFW was steering this toward a seemingly predetermined outcome, um, making it sometimes more challenging for stakeholders to come to the table in good faith and work toward solutions to these complex problems. Um, and as the agency continues to grapple with funding fluctuations and public percep perception challenges, it's imperative that their management approach reflect the values of Oregonians and best available science, which calls to question many of the provisions included in this draft plan. Um, so as you make your final decision on the draft plan, I urge you to ensure that we have a plan which actually achieves the intended objective, um, a management plan which results in fewer dead livestock, fewer dead wolves, and less human conflict. Three seconds to spare. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Within two seconds. That was really good. All right, thank you. I'm on. Yes, you're on. I'm trying to trying to decipher. Who's next? Maybe you could start with your name. Name and, and address for yeah. the uh, record. Sheila Redmond, Portland, Oregon. Yes. Okay, Sheila. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate the past efforts of the commission in working to help wolf recovery in Oregon, but I am concerned about some of the provisions that have been expressed by a number of other 
people who have come up here and testified. And of course, the main ones are the possibility of hunting wolves, and also the two depredations just sounds totally unreasonable. Um, and I would like both of those to be a adjusted in some way that would be more in keeping with reality. And you know, like most Oregonians, I believe that wolves and wildlife are to be protected, and that you know our natural resources are be going to be protected. And you know, I, this is a difficult time for me because I'm afraid, and I think a lot of people are, that wolves will be taken off of the endangered species list pretty shortly, um, and that your plan is going to be all that stands between them and the people who just want them gone. And it's especially disturbing to me because, sorry, I do this. I'm just because this is a time when I'm becoming, and a lot of people are becoming acutely aware of the plight of species all over the world. You know, Chinook salmon, orcas, giraffes, all, you know, all of these species are dying. They're facing extinction. The oceans are dying, floods, fires. I could go on and on. It feels like everything is dying all around us. And here we have this commission that is charged with protecting and, our, and conserving our wildlife and our wolves, and it's like I feel that our, our priority should be not protecting livestock. You know, I think that there should be a separate livestock commission, but the Oregon Commission of Fish and Wildlife should, protect, should be protecting fish and wildlife because they're the most important things right now. Cattle are not in danger of extinction. <clears throat> we will be if we don't change the way we're doing things. Everything is very fragile right now, and I think that it's important to change the way we're doing business because it's going to mean our future. Thanks. Thank you. Please state your name and rec your name and address for the record. Mm. Um, my name is Mary Ann Erickson, and I'm a resident of Portland. Um, although I'm a city dweller, um, I spend as much time as I can at my family's um, off-grid cabin in Wasco County. Um, and we are not far as the crow flies from the White, family, the White River family of wolves. Um, we have a wildlife camera and a pond, and um, our hope of our whole family, including my little grandchildren, is that someday we may see a wolf on our wildlife camera and maybe hear the howl of a wolf um, on the landscape. Um, when the wolf plan was sent back to the drawing board last year, I had some modest hopes that there might be a shift in how the wildlife agency views our wolves. Um, given the advances in our understanding of wolf culture and uh, wolf's family lives, and especially compelling now, as Sheila said, in this era of mass extinction, of the power of wolves to upgrade ecosystems. Um, I had hopes that maybe the momentum would shift to be more on the side of the wolves. Um, unfortunately, I feel that this opportunity has been squandered and we have instead ended up with a plan that reflects neither what I understand to be the best available science nor the best available ethics. Um, a number of provisions in the plan make it easier to kill wolves, and others have enumerated those. Um, I'm especially concerned about the expansion of the range of people authorized to take wolves, and I don't like these euphemisms, by the way. <laughs> um, and to me, this opens the door to um, killing wolves by people of unknown motivation and skill, um, and is likely to result in the constant tearing of the wolf's social fabric. Um, sadly, um, as someone wrote, one bullet can shatter a whole family of wolves. Um, it also, I think, leads to the disempowerment of wolves to do their job for planet Earth, which is really important now. In closing, I just want to say that I find it really disturbing that trophy hunting of wolves remains on the table at all. Um, surely the point of restoring wolves to the landscape is not to reach the point where we can hunt and trap them. Just because it was part of the original wolf plan 
um, doesn't mean that something that's so antithetical to the values of the majority of Oregonians should live on in subsequent plans, including this one. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Commissioners, Commissioner Aikinson. I have a question for Danielle. Um, do you think that our current wolf plan has been successful? Chair Finley, Commissioner Aikinson, um, Yes, we think the, the phase one provisions and um, what we've seen from there has actually been a leader nationally um, because it set a high bar for when wolves could be killed. It really um, prioritized preventing conflict. And from that, we, we believe we've seen success. Okay, thanks. Um, I just had a comment also for Sheila. Um, I understand your concern for the future of wildlife and our planet. and. I encourage you to look at the wolf plan and, and look at what has happened so far with wolves in Oregon. Um, we have a really positive trajectory of wolf numbers increasing every year. So I know we can't look at the future at this point, but look at where we've come from and have some hope that things are going well with wolves. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, panel. Um, I'm having problem with this one. I can't distinguish between a K or a D. Kebra or Deborah? Queller? I'm really sorry if I butchered it, but <laughs> all right. What is what is your name? Kebria. 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 Oh, that's pretty. Okay. Okay. Now I have that. Let's see. Joan Belden and Mary Grace Brogdon. Cabria, we'll start with you. All right. Um, Chair Finley and Commissioners, my name is Cabria Cuellar. I live and work in Springfield, Oregon, and I'm here as an engaged citizen who has been advocating for wolves since I was a child. Um, when I first learned about wolves in the late 80s, it was within the context of when they would go extinct in the lower 48. As everyone here knows, it wasn't until 2008, 12 years after the Northern Rockies reintroduction and over 60 years since the last wolf was killed for a bounty in the state that our first pack was confirmed. Today, 11 years later, we have an estimated 137 wolves, mostly in the northeast corner of the state with a very small portion of those west of the Cascades. In fact, only two packs. This is a very big state. I don't believe that is a viable state population at all. I have concerns about the plan, mostly about wildlife services and about um, controlled take and uh, the possibility of controlled hunts in the future. Um, it's gonna echo similar sediments as others. Um, my concerns with wildlife services conducting depredation investigations are um, due to its track record of blaming wolves when they weren't involved, overestimating when they were, killing the wrong one, moving carcasses, and filing inaccurate reports. The agency has demonstrated its lack of integrity and lost public trust. I have concerns about using controlled takes where members of the public can hunt and trap wolves to assist the department in obtaining management objectives. When even trained department personnel have made grave mistakes in such operations, how are we supposed to trust a member of the public with the task and what are the repercussions of abuse or misuse? I am concerned about the parts of this plan that mention using controlled take when certain ungulate populations are low as scientific review has pointed to poor habitat quality, not predators for low herd numbers. Most concerning though, are the mentions of controlled hunts open to the general public as a future option for wolf management. Just mentioning opens the door to future policy. Our current and likely near future population is not recovered and couldn't sustain hunting losses. A study was referenced earlier where poaching increased when hunting was allowed by the public. It did not increase public tolerance, not to mention the majority of Oregon, Oregonians oppose wolf hunting. 
As I mentioned, I'm from Springfield. I'm kind of biased here. It is a pro-wolf, or excuse me, pro-hunting community. We may be close to Eugene, but we're very different culturally and demographically. I have a lot of friends and family that are hunters, and unfortunately, I've heard a lot of the uh, vitriol, a lot of the, um, the false narratives that are being pushed around regarding wolves specifically. Um, and so I have to say that that's where a lot of this comes from, and the idea of allowing the public to um, take, hunt, or however you want to phrase it, is frightening. Um, finishing up, after four long years of delay and deliberation, this plan is insufficient for protecting our small population of this keystone species and allowing them to recover. I thank you for allowing me to express my opinion. Okay, thank you. Ms. Belden. My name is Joan Belden, and I live in here in Portland. And I'm a co-founder of a um, science-based wolf education program called Wolf Waste. And I can say without a doubt that our young people want and deserve fully recovered wolves in their future. Um, Oregon, uh, ODFW has a noble and a good mission to protect and, and enhance our wildlife, including wolves, for future and, and present and future generations. However, Contrary to that mission, um, the low bar of two depredations makes, uh, makes it just easier to kill wolves. And without clear requirements for non-lethal, killing wolves then becomes the main predator control tool. Wolves are highly intelligent. Uh, a, pack, a wolf pack is a very devoted and caring family unit, ri rivaling that of humans. The parents, uh, they typically mate for life, they mourn deeply, deaths in their family, they're unique, um, sentient animals um, who have who share a lot of social traits um, with us, and they are not elk and deer, and they should never be managed similarly. Uh, the wolf family um, works together to hunt prey much larger than themselves, which is a life-threatening endeavor. It takes two years for them to learn these skills from elders who pass down their their knowledge through generations, and this is important to understand about wolves because when you kill adult wolves, you, you remove that important knowledge base. Studies have repeatedly shown that randomly killing adult wolves can break the family structure, which can lead to new breeding pairs and more packs. Cattle and sheep can become the easier targets for young orphaned wolves, as well as surviving adults who are just too few in number to bring down these dangerous prey. These factors increase the risk of depredation. Killing wolves can end up increasing rather than decreasing depredation. Uh, so a plan that makes it easier to kill wolves is, isn't the answer. It's time to bring this plan back into alignment with your mission. Defender of Wildlife's uh, Livestock Conflict Pre Prevention Plan brings, I feel, hope from that. It can bring hope to wolves, ranchers, and livestock alike. alike. And I think it should be included as a goal in this plan. And this plan should and I believe can become a tool that will promote coexistence between wolves and those who live near them. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Grace. Thank you, Chair Finley, Deputy Director Hearn, esteemed commissioners, and brave fellow citizens. I am a resident of Springfield, Oregon. I am an unpaid volunteer for Forest Web of Cottage Grove. I am self-employed and actually lost money by being here today. Thank you for your time and consideration. If anybody here has not read it, the ODFW mission statement is on your website and it says that the purpose of the department is to protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife for further generations to use and enjoy or something along those lines. And the proper use of a wolf is not to be hunted. A wolf is a culturally significant animal to Native Americans in Oregon, as well as to other groups. To legitimate the hunting of wolves is to further endorse the oppression of Native peoples. The tribal member protesting in the lobby this morning did not feel it would be useful to say this to you, but I am hopeful. After all, we the people of Oregon, with the guidance of our lawmakers and the ODFW, have made and executed a plan to welcome wolf into our land, we have stepped back into relationship with this iconic animal that, has ex that was extirpated by earlier generations. We have come so far. It is to be celebrated. 
let us continue this amended relationship between our species without repeating the mistakes of the past. Any legalized hunting of wolves fuels the idea that killing wolves is acceptable behavior outside of situations of defense. Fueling that idea increases the likelihood of illegitimate violence against wolves and dogs who look like wolves. My best friend is a rather wolfy dog. We encountered our first wild wolf April 7th of this year in the Willamette National Forest. It was raining hard and the creeks were flooding. We were on a rarely used, heavily da storm damaged trail. From about 40 feet, I saw the wolf for four seconds before it melted off into the bracken. It was electrifying. It was inspiring of awe. It was mysterious. I even forgot to be afraid for my dog, <laughs> but she was fine. She came bursting out of the bracken next to me a second after the wolf disappeared. She led me back to the Jeep 10 feet at a time, making sure that I was catching up and not lagging. And I thought about reporting the sighting to you um, at the time, but I decided not to, not out of fear for being accused of crying wolf at a time when wolves were not documented in the place where I saw one, but for fear that this information might be somehow used against the wolf by an agency who hasn't yet decided on the proper use of a wolf. The proper use of a wolf is to be encountered like any other person with respect and an open mind. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Um, commissioners. Okay. Thank you for coming. Can I hand in the written comment I was supposed to read? Thanks. Always. Okay, our next panel consists of uh, Amarok Weiss, Jen Wolfsong, and Mallory Abel. We'll start with you, Amarok. Thank you. Chair Finlay, members of the Commission, Deputy Director Hearn. My name is Amaruk Weiss. I live in Petaluma, California. <laughs> Sorry. Every time. <laughs> Next time. I know better, don't I? <laughs> I formerly lived in Talent, Oregon. I am a biologist and former attorney, and I am the senior West Coast Wolf Advocate for the Center for Biological Diversity. Back in 2003, I was appointed by this commission to be one of the original stakeholders to advise the agency in developing the 2000 Wolf Plan. My comments today are delivered on behalf of the nearly 30,000 Oregon members and supporters of the Center for Biological Diversity. I want to just take a moment to respond to some questions about conservation groups' agreement to special status game mammal and controlled take that have come up uh, earlier today. And uh, I want to point out that not every group supported the 2005 Wolf Plan. And not every group that agreed to the plan supported every component in the plan. And I do want to say that those who did agree to the designation of special status game mammal and to controlled take did so with the gravest concerns that these provisions would be abused and that the thresholds for use of controlled take would be lowered. And that's exactly what we're seeing now with the department proposing a much lower threshold of take of wolves being a major factor instead of wolves being the cause for an ungulate population decline. So our, our concerns are coming to fruit right now. Not only that, but the groups that did agree to it did it only because ODFW told us that without that designation, without the controlled take, without the game mammal status, ODFW did not have funds to do wolf conservation in the state and required the Pittman, Robertson, and other federal funds that would be accessed with that designation. Current best available science finds that wolf hunting and trapping is ineffective for solving wolf livestock conflicts. It reduces social tolerance for wolves and it's associated with increased wolf poaching. It can be highly destructive to a wolf pack social structure, cohesion, reproductive success, and pup survivorship, and also impairs wolf genetic processes and the ecosystem functions that wolves provide. 72.4% of Oregonians oppose trophy hunting of wolves. 81.9% believe poaching, not wolves, poses the greatest threat to deer and elk populations and hunting opportunities. And 81.1% think that prosecuting poachers 
rather than killing wolves, would be more effective to promote healthy deer and elk populations and hunting opportunities. Some folks previously and even in today and today's testimony have argued that the commission can't change what's already in the wolf plan, the controlled take, the hunting and trapping of wolves by private citizens because it's been in the plan from the start. Yet when everything says that wolf hunting and trapping is wrong, is this commission actually going to say it cannot change that? In the face of overwhelming scientific evidence that it is wrong and ineffective and harms wolves, and in the face of overwhelming public opposition, the commission can do it. Everyone knows you can do it. And the state won't lose Pittman-Robertson funds if you do, as we heard earlier today from the department. In 2015, conservation groups expressed deep concern that state delisting prior to conducting the five-year wolf plan update would mean wolves would be delisted without knowing what safeguards would be in place once they were delisted. And in response, at a public meeting, then Commissioner Weber said, the commission can make any changes it wants to the wolf plan whenever it wants to. Just look back at this commission's decision not to rubber stamp the Black Department's proposal to expand the black bear spring hunt. Look at your decision just last year to uplist and then downlist the marble muralette. The commission has made major changes to management plans, to protections and hunts in the past. It can do it now. Science and the public say it should be changed. Therefore, it needs to be changed. Earlier today, representative from Congressman DeFazio's office let us all know that Congressman DeFazio has asked that the controlled take provisions be stricken from the plan. And we second that request. I want to take just a moment, if I can, to respond to some questions that Commissioner Wally had asked about. Um, can, we, can we wait till the question period? Yeah, you bet. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, for those of you who are watching the bar, uh, I allowed uh, Emerald to extend her remarks a little bit because the preface she did was to clarify what I considered to be an important background uh, about uh, the plan and some of the previous stuff. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, Jen. I'm actually Mallory. I'm sorry, Mallory. Chair <laughs> Finley. <laughs> <laughs> You're next. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. Chair <laughs> Finley, commissioners. Um, my name is Mallory Abel. I'm from Portland currently, and I'm here today as an interested party. I'm currently an environmental law student at Lewis and Clark Law School, but I came here today as a former wildlife biologist. I have experience in wildlife research, and the five years that I have of that motivated me to move here to attend a law school from the East Coast. Um, some of that experience included working on a wolf research management project in Yellowstone National Park, and that exposed me to the plethora of difficulties surrounding wolf management and conflict mitigation, and I understand just how much of a nightmare this can be. Um, however, some of the language in the new plan is concerning to me. I'm just gonna reiterate briefly a couple things that many people have already said. Um, it seems that the language is evolving to permit broader non-targeted killing of wolves, potentially by private citizens, the deviation from the controlled take language to controlled hunt in section three, the departure from targeted take insinuates the departure from targeted killing um, and just killing of any wolves. Additionally, the potential process allowing permits to be issued to private citizens to kill on the agency's behalf is equally concerning. I moved here from the East Coast where we have virtually no wolves left. Oregon should be proud of the status of its wolf population. It has come so far, and you have set a national standard. But Oregon has come too far to lose sight of less expensive and more effective options available to mitigate livestock losses, other than allowing broader, untargeted killing of wolves or the hunting of wolves by private citizens. Thank you for giving me time to express my opinion. Thank you. Now, Jen. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. <laughs> Um, my name is uh, Jen Wolfsong. I'm a small business owner in Beaverton, Oregon. Um, thank you for taking the time to hear my testimony today. Um, I believe you will find my testimony to be germane. Although I am an urban dweller, one of the reasons why I chose to settle in Oregon was the ability to leave the city and find beauty not so far away. I am just as invested in management and conservation of our land and wildlife as someone who lives in a rural setting outside a major metropolitan area. 
In my life, I have twice had the amazing luck of experiencing wolves in the wild, once in the White Mountains of Arizona and once in Alaska. When my daughter was in third grade, she's now 15, she wrote a poem in which she listed one of her three greatest wishes behind wishing that no one would go hungry and wishing that papaya grew in Oregon was the wish that there were more wolves in the world. Um, these experiences have enhanced my desire to see wolf recovery in Oregon. I believe this wolf plan falls far short of protecting wolves and wolf recovery. For example, defining chronic depredation as two and a nine month period is the actual opposite of what chronic is. If you were to go to thesaurus.com and search chronic, the antonym would come up as tube depredations in a nine month period. During your video conference call on May 17th, several of you acknowledged that you never authorized a wolf to be killed after two depredations in nine months. So if that is true, why not revise the plan to better reflect the reality and what the rest of the English speaking world understands as the true definition of chronic. Um, I'm also troubled by the provisions in the plan to allow hunting and trapping of wolves by the public. We have only 137 wolves in Oregon and we have not recovered wolves in most of this state. I believe it is careless at best and willful disregard of science at worst to contemplate public permits to kill wolves when the majority of Oregonians oppose this. Of course, this only serves to remind me that this commission has a chronic problem with science, chronic conflicts of interest, and a chronic disdain for actual wolf recovery. And I'd like to just go off strip a script today to request that um, Commissioner Akinson please recuse herself from this decision. She obviously has a blatant conflict of interest and even if you think you can make a fair decision on this, the appearance of the conflict really reduces the credibility of this commission. Thank you. Okay. Commissioners. Commissioner Akinson. Um, I had a question for Amaruk. Um, you said that, um, did you say that the threshold for controlled take has been lowered since the original wolf plan that you were involved with crafting? That reduced threshold is being now proposed in this current draft, yes. Relative to the original? That's correct. You know, I saw that in several people's comments there was concern about hunting being new or being at a greater level. I look back at the 2005 wolf plan to try to find that, and I didn't find that. Um, I've got two different places where I saw where um, controlled take was discussed, and one of them was page 39, said, when phase three is reached, more emphasis may be put on lethal control to ensure protection of livestock. In areas where chronic wolf problems are occurring, Wolf managers may seek assistance from private citizens through special permits for controlled take to resolve conflict. So it wasn't really specific. Um, then on page 45 regarding phase three, it said public or tribal controlled take of wolves on public land by special permit may be authorized in specific areas to address chronic wolf livestock depredation or wolf-related ungulate population or recruitment declines below management objectives in a wildlife management unit or locally. This approach also may be implemented on private lands. So I don't see that what we're proposing today is, uh, what did you call it, is a lowered threshold than that language. So there's, so if I may, uh, Yes. Sure. Chair Finley, yes. Commissioner Akinson, there's actually two issues in the question that you're posing there. So first, is there changed language? Uh, yes, there is. I went line by line through the plan. Of course, there's now the new, entire new section on special status game mammals. So obviously there's new language there. But the language that popped out to me as being new was this is the first time that the department in the wolf plan has defined the difference between a general season hunt controlled take and controlled hunting. So just the fact that that is now being elaborated, mm -hmm. that there are these three different ways that one could hunt wolves, I can tell you that raised alarm in me. I suspect that that raised alarm in other people. In addition, this is the first time in the plan where we've seen this statement about before it could happen, there has to be a commission process. And if I remember correctly, I don't think it says before there's controlled take, 
I think it says before there are controlled hunts, which further alarmed me because in the definition that was given of those three different things, controlled hunt is much broader than controlled take. Controlled hunt actually involves licenses and permits and, and uh, like maybe done through a lottery or something. So I those think, two pieces are new, but that's yeah. separate from the threshold question, which okay. I'll get to. I'm just going to say regarding to. controlled hunt and controlled take, I think we'll let Derek discuss that with us because um, he he actually helped us yesterday with those definitions. Sure. Um, can I what, can I explain the second issue? One more question, though, okay. and then you can. Yeah. Um, so, what does the plan say about general hunts? This, so, I believe that the plan says at this time no general season hunting is allowed. Or does it just say no general season will be allowed? I I, I don't know. Okay. You have the plan in front of you. I don't. I, yeah, I don't have that page open. But my impression is it clearly is saying general hunts will not be part of this plan. So. So, so there's no need to talk about something that's not going to happen. But so it go does ahead talk with about your second point. But it does say that controlled hunts yes. will yeah. take place after a commission process. May take place if there's only a commission process after a public right. process. And we put ask for that to be put in so it would be clear to everyone this commission's not going to just meet and say, "Yep, let's do it." Um, it's One going to be a not. thorough process, and you can be assured that you will be invited to provide input and the public will be a big part of that process. So the second issue where there is a definite lowering of the threshold is that if you had a chance to read through my letter and read through the attachments I sent, I provided the pertinent pages from the 2005, 2010, both 2017 drafts to show the language changes that have happened and up to the present. In the 2005 draft, control take for ungulate population declines said that wolves had to be the cause. 2010, the, I provided the pages, 2010, it does not change the language. It still says, first it says that you first have to determine that carnivores are the primary. And then if you determine it's carnivores, if you're gonna look at wolves, wolves have to be the cause. That didn't change in the 2010 update. Starting in 2017, we saw that language change. There was an April draft and a uh, November draft. And in both of those drafts, the language changed. In one case, it was changed to, I believe, a major, uh, a major cause and also a significant factor. And then in the most recent version that we've seen in the 2019 plan, it now says wolves have to be a major factor. And in the May 17th hearing, when questioned by the commission about that change, Director Melcher informed that the reason that was changed, or maybe it was Kevin Blakely who informed, excuse me, I think it was Mr. Blakely, informed that the reason that change was made was on the advice of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because ODFW would not be able to prove statistically significant through scientific means that wolves were the cause, and therefore, since they couldn't meet a scientific standard and could risk facing litigation, they had changed the threshold. So the threshold and do you is you agree now with that, that piece that uh, ODFW may not be able to prove something and therefore that's a legitimate reason? I think there's never a legitimate reason for an agency to kill a wildlife species if they cannot scientifically prove that that species is the cause of the problem they're trying to solve okay. by killing that animal. Okay, thank you. I think that's immoral. Okay, thank you. May I, may I address? Yes. Commissioner Woolley's questions about the Chaperone and Travis paper. Thank sure. you. Sure. Chair Finley, Commissioner Woolley. You did ask uh, ODFW whether or not the Chaperone and Travis paper was a lone wolf, an outlier paper. So I just wanted to respond to that briefly. So that paper in 2016 is part of a series of papers that came out of the University of Wisconsin Carnivore Conservation Lab in 2009, 2013, 2015. 2016 was the latest of those papers, all supporting that conclusion that uh, uh, culling of wolves, whether through agency action or hunting and trapping by uh, citizens, leads to increased inclination to poach and increased poaching at the incidences. And in addition to that, in 2018, Laxonen et al. published a similar paper uh, reporting on hunting in Finland and determined that uh, although hunting was being allowed to supposedly increase social tolerance for wolves, they found that the result instead was that it maintained social aversion to tolerance of wolves. 
So it's not an outlier. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Ms. Wolfsong, um, I'd like to understand the basis uh, for your statement that Commissioner Akinson has a conflict of interest. Well, her, her husband is, is, is provided testimony here today, and I think that that's a conflict of interest for her to hear his testimony and then be able to make a neutral vote based on science and... Okay. Council, will, will you read me our regulations on conflict of interest? Yeah, so this is from the, um, this is the statutory provisions on conflict of interest that govern this commission and when or whether they're required to recuse themselves from any vote or to put any potential conflict of interest on the record. And um, so this, the conflict of interest is defined as any action or any decision or recommendation by a person acting in a capacity as a public official the effect of which would or could be to the private pecuniary benefit or detriment of the person or the person's relatives or any business with, with which the person or relative of the person is associated. I know that that's cumbersome, but it's, what it's saying is that the focus of a conflict of interest inquiry and whether you actually have one which would, um, which would require someone to recuse themselves is if their decision would re result in a private pecuniary benefit or detriment. And so it's, um, that's, that's where the inquiry has to focus. So could someone explain to me why there wouldn't be necessarily that here? I couldn't hear the question. I, I'm not sure exactly why that is a given that that's not the case well, here. The and maybe I just says. don't understand. You, I don't think you do, and I'm ruling she doesn't have a conflict of interest, but thank you for your statement. Well, but you didn't answer my question. Why, why is that not, a, why does that not apply to this case? There's I think in order for that to be the case, um, by Commissioner Akinson's vote, it would have to be a certainty that her husband would get money. Um, and that's not a certainty here? No. Okay. That, you know, and I'm not going to rule it that way either. So, well, even if it does comply with the rules, I'd just like to say the appearance of it. The commission already has very limited credibility um, with, with its past actions, and I just think that, it, you know, it would be really great if you could actually, if you think there's no conflict of interest, to actually address it so that maybe the public can actually have some faith that your decisions are based on science and what's best for Oregon. How about for her credibility and so will every one of these commissioners. There's no conflict of interest because they're husband and wife. She is an independent person. She makes her own judgment. She's a trained scientist. So thank you very much. Amara, would you like to finish the rest of your testimony that you didn't get to say? Do you remember what it was? Um, I, I, I think I finished it there was one other piece to the okay, Chappone and ahead. Travis paper, We'd like if to I hear may. that. Okay. So uh, another question that came up on the Chaperone and Travis paper, um, I think that um, the question, again, was whether or not it was an outlier. And I think that uh, Derek Broman responded that the paper had been read by several other authors. So I just want to make the note that the rebuttals by the three other authors were then rebutted by Chapron and Trevis. All three papers were rebutted in published work by Chapron and Trevis. And since there were no counter counter rebuttals, that means that Chapron and Trevis is still sound and still stands as the final word on that issue. Okay. Thank, thank you for taking that to the farthest iteration. Um, <laughs> That's what I do. So thank you. Okay, commissioners, any other? Thank you, panel. Thank you. All right. Sorry. Five, and that's six. Paula Feldmeyer. Alex Woolery. Desiree. Mary Scow. Oh, 
Ms. Feldmeyer. Okay. Hello, Mike. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Chair Finley, uh, Commissioners, and Deputy Director Hearn. Uh, my name is Paula Feldmeyer, and I'm a resident of Salem. And I have some serious concerns with the proposed revisions to the Oregon State Wolf Plan because it will allow for the increased killing of wolves for only two depredations in nine months time frame and opens the door for the public to kill wolves under the control trait provisions by allowing entities that ODFW itself said today it doesn't concern itself with the qualifications thereof. I didn't hear anything in ODFW's presentation that provided science-based proof that 137 wolves is the magic number that will allow a formerly extirpated population of wolves in Oregon to sustainably move toward recovery with an increase in legal killings. Can they withstand this? 137 for a state as large as Oregon seems very low. Where was the science to support this? This is parallel um, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, proposed delisting of the wolf under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, a proposal which the Washington Post reported on on May 31st that the panel of scientists tasked with reviewing the federal government plans to lift protections for the wolves found that the Fish and Wildlife Services plan had factual er logistical errors, misstatements and gaps and um, some of the scientists there were concerned with the, increased legal, with the increase in legal killings would also raise the potential for poaching. With less protection, illegal, illegal killings could rise. There were a few discrepancies that I heard today regarding Wolf's impacts on alleged elk population explosion in the state. There was a proposal to allow landowners to kill more elk due to a population explosion and their impacts on lands. Yet elk decline is a reason put forward to allow the kill increased killing of wolves. Which is it? It doesn't seem the wolves can win here. Why not let the wolves serve their natural function of natural predator? Trapping to kill wolves is inhumane and fraught with collateral damage of impacting non-targets, especially dogs and even humans. Finally, I was concerned with ODFW's assertion of discretion being based um, seemingly on arbitrary factors for the increase, um, the, for the two um, killing um, factor. This doesn't instill, for example, one of the uh, um, factors seem to be if it's in your face and, and it presents extreme circumstances. This doesn't seem to instill a lot of confidence. Ambiguity on some of the provisions is also concerning. For instance, there doesn't appear to be an actual requirement to implement um, non-lethal measures. Also, there's the, the, the term appropriate. Where is the appropriate defined? There doesn't seem to be any actual um, measures in that provision. I strongly support ODFW's funding of interdisciplinary non-lethal depredation prevention measures in the state and I impose the proposal of these revisions. Okay, thank you. Mr. Woolery. Thank you, Chair Finley and Commissioners. Um, my name is Alex Woolery and I live in Portland. I'm here to urge the Commission to reject or completely revise this final draft plan. I've been following ODFW hearings and giving testimony across the state for about four years. In that time, I've watched versions of this plan get progressively weaker in spite of vigorous testimony from landowners, hunters, wildlife biologists, conservation and land advo advocacy groups, and a diversity of concerned members of the public, all in support of wolf protections and science-based policy. I'm not going to mince words. I'm incredibly disappointed with new provisions of the wolf plan update that after four years of attempts to come up with a satisfactory plan, this is what's being delivered for a vote. Um, I work in resource and natural area conservation. My work has taught me what a critical role wildlife play in supporting the landscapes they inhabit. Wolves uh, not only help maintain the health of wildlife populations such as deer and elk, the presence has cascading positive effects on the behaviors and ranges of many other species, increasing biodiversity, watershed health, and ecosystem resilience. Wolves are a conservation and economic benefit to the state of Oregon, and the wolf plan should reflect this. Instead, it treats wolves as a liability and a threat in a manner far out of proportion with any scientific or economic reality. At a time when our natural environments, wildlife populations, and ecosystem integrity are all under grave threat from climate stress and environmental damage, it's doubly irresponsible to approve a wolf plan that puts a vital recovering keystone species at even greater risk. Wolves are just starting to come back to Oregon and have barely dispersed it all from the northeastern part of the state. In spite of this, this update further threatens whether wolves' recovery even as they may lose their federal ESA protection. The draft plan includes provisions to Deputize members of the public to, to hunt and trap wolves, which is a terrible, irresponsible way of managing wolf populations, 
and would further foster negative public attitudes and encourage illegal wolf poaching. We've already had two such incidents last year. Furthermore, hunting has been shown to disrupt wolf, wolf pack cohesion and behavior and actually increases the risk of livestock conflicts, working against the goals of your plan. The plan update also renders the section on non-lethal deterrence methods even more vague and completely unenforceable. The plan simply lists types of deterrence and stipulates having a non-lethal deterrence plan is recommended but not required. This is indefensible, especially given the clear science on how effective non-lethal methods are. The plan would also lower the threshold of what ODFNW considers chronic depredation to only two confirmed kills across nine months. This so-called chronic threshold is absurd and simply too low. As a public agency, ODFNW is responsible to act on the best science, to be responsive to the public will, and to draft a plan that effectively maintains and protects wolf populations that which, uh, sorry, while also including effective, actionable, science-based means to help prevent unnecessary livestock depredations. This final draft of the Wolf Plan update does none of these things, and I urge you to reject it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi, commissioners, um, Chair, um, Chair Finley and commissioners. My name is Desiree uh, Mariscal, and I live in Portland. I want to start by saying that um, to Commissioner Eckerson, I am not happy, and I don't think that this is time to celebrate considering that we only have 137 wolves in the state of Oregon, and with your draft, the way it's, the plan, the way it's drafted, it can only lower them. Um, right now, my feelings are of disappointment that ODFW has reached to such a low point of weakened protections for wolves and even provisions to allow the public to hunt them in this plan if it gets approved. In my understanding, ODFW is responsible for protecting and enhancing Oregon's fish and wildlife and their habitats. With this draft, the wolf plan, uh, with this new draft for the wolf plan, these elements of protection and enhancement of habitats are clearly missing. Um, I'm gonna skip a couple of items. Uh, I have been a meat eater for most of my life until recently. I've stopped eating meat because I don't want to contribute to industries that support and endorse the killing of wolves and other wildlife without taking into account and responsibility no-kill methods that have been very effective in the past. We need a wolf recovery plan, not a wolf hunting plan. The language in the wolf plan at the moment contains very vague and misleading language that can be taken as active endorsement for the killing of wolves. The final draft update to the plan includes provisions to deputize the public and hunt trap wolves when conflict arises. This fosters negative sentiment and opens the door for anyone to kill wolves. It lowers the threshold of what is considered chronic depredations to only two incidences in nine months. This is extremely low and unrealistic. It doesn't even constitute what chronic is. Um, and I would really like that to be explained to me further. Um, these revisions would change non-lethal measures from a requirement to unforceable suggestion. Um, you are basically giving instructions if you approve this plan and the go for the public to kill wolves for any possible reason without even trying non-lethal alternatives first. What is your motive behind these actions and the language you're implementing into this draft? Are you trying to deceive us? And also, are you trying to, sorry, to decimate the wolf population in Oregon? I just want to remind you again that you're here to represent the views of us, the people and the public and wildlife, not to affiliate with the Cattlemen's Association and the industries that have very biased opinion. I, I, why are you ignoring the majority of us? Why are you not listening to us in the scientific data? Thank you. I can't continue. May I make one quick additional comment? Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to speak in support of the previous commenter's uh, call for Commissioner Aikenstein to recuse herself. Um, and, a, and a board that I work for, uh, a former board member, whenever his his work would come up on a vote, um, you know, giving grant money, that kind of thing, even the appearance of conflict, he'd, he'd state something and he'd, he'd, he'd recuse himself from the vote. And so I, I support that call and I support openly expressing um, what connections you have whenever you're in a board meeting and those sort, you know, even the slightest appearance comes up. That, that, that's my comment in support of that. Our rules say that Commissioner Aikens can say that there is a potential conflict of interest, yeah. but still vote. 
I understand. Thank you. Okay. In your example, there is exactly pointing out the situation that is not present here. Your example with um, with the board giving out grant money. That's the type of situation that the that the statutes are aimed at. Understood. I mean, it, it, even ones that didn't have any sort of direct monetary benefit, he'd off he would often uh, recuse himself. So uh, I gave perhaps the strongest example, but. Okay. Thank you, panel. Thank you. I please ask you to consider us. And I'm sorry I, I lost it, but I just really want to state that our views need to be heard. Thank you. Okay. Miriam Eckhart, Roger Huffman, and Susan Strauss. We'll start with uh, you, Marion. Chair Finley and members of the commission, thank you for your time. Um, I would like to start by saying uh, that um, I'm a passionate citizen of Oregon. I think this place is really beautiful. I grew up in California, um, but I have to say Oregon is, is you know, I, one of the places in the nation that have the most beautiful wilderness and have the people who really care about it so much. Um, I'm also a passionate wildlife biologist in my profession. I work in the private industry. And I just find a lot of what was presented in that PowerPoint to be non-scientific. Um, I find it to lack data that, um, you know, from economic to behavioral, um, Another thing I would like to address is I feel like the behavior of the animals in question here has not really been mentioned whatsoever. And I think that's a huge problem when you're trying to manage an animal that you will not acknowledge their ecological and, and dynamic behavior with each other. It's been proven time and time again that if you destructure a wolf pack, which is what these takes are, you're going to cause further depredation because these farm animals are not as dangerous as elk and deer. Elk and deer can defend themselves. These farm animals are bred to be docile, slow, and fat. And, you know, when you kill, a, you know, a alpha wolf or and that's usually the case. It's usually a breeding female. I've been keeping up with um, the kills made by the department. It's usually an alpha male or a breeding female. And you're leaving all these youngsters, and you know what they're going to do is they're going to go for livestock. So I just don't understand at all how viable this is to do this take method. And of course, um, you know, echoed much before, I think really the major focus should be, you know, in supporting the ranchers. And you know, that's not even a personal sentiment to me. That's a just um, compromise and the logical way forward. They need help to do these non-lethal methods and that should be the huge focus of this plan, not having a myriad of ways to take wolves. Um, and you know, even with the industry aside, uh, you know, are we going to view wildlife? Does this commission and does this department view wildlife as products? Is, is, that, is that kind of what we're saying here? And if that's so, I mean, I just don't understand how you're able to take that stance with the majority of the population does not take that stance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Huffman. Yeah, thank you. Um, Roger Huff, excuse me, Chair Finley, uh, Commission members, and Deputy Director Hearn. I'm Roger Huffman. Um, I'm from Union, Oregon currently. I was here in Salem and, 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 and actually for about 25 years of my 31 years in state service, I was in charge of the predator programs at the Department of Agriculture. Um, I'm co-chair of the Wolf uh, Committee for the Cattlemen and a current producer, livestock producer. I uh, want to thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this important discussion over the years. We've had a long history of predator control and predator programs. 
and of course state state implementation of those things. I think my biggest asset over my 31 years of state service was the ability to apply my life experiences to the laws and rules um, and most in the most practical and effective outcomes. Uh, oftentimes the spirit versus the letter of the law. I see this as, a, as the largest challenge to approve a plan that is responsible, reasonable, and reactive. To approve a plan that doesn't give clear guidance to your agency and would, would be a disservice to them, the people in this room, and the animals themselves. This leads to my encouragement by all the livestock producers in the state to acknowledge our delisting de accomplishments our continued expansion of wolves into the all areas of the state and our likelihood of federal delisting statewide. This acknowledgement would give you, uh, would give you a plan that includes all tools available as well as a clear path that embraces management as much as it does or more than it does conservation. These wolves are more than capable of sustaining a viable population into the future with, our, with or without our help. A uh, good example is the rogue pack. As, as staff has told you, it's, near, it's been nearly impossible to get a collar on one, uh, especially on this west side with all the cover. But um, you've heard many buzzwords today and catchphrases, uh, climate change, connectivity, resources versus needs, perception, citizen science. I mean, I've got a whole list of stuff, but. Really, I think in reality, our producers, it really boils down to us, uh, really want the animal to be managed uh, when it needs to be managed um, by you guys. It produces the confidence um, of everybody that that is your responsibility and that you will do that when it's necessary. Uh, and in that vein, that you take the effort today to provide clear guidance to the ODFW staff uh, of how you're going to do that, but ultimately it comes down to um, that gives uh, clear direction. It also includes wildlife services where it's appropriate, and at times uh, in the control take phase, um, whatever form that comes, you guys create it. But it needs to be a necessary part of the plan for us. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you, Ms. Strauss. Yes, hello, commissioners. Um, uh, so I would like to speak today. I'm uh, Susan Strauss of Bend, Oregon. Um, I'm in my 60s, and I've been interested in wolves since I was 16. And I've read as much, I'm not a scientist, but I've read as much science as I can about them. I find that the pack structure of the animal is so incredible, and I've actually seen wolves in the wild. Um, hunting and bringing down a calf elk in Yellowstone. And watching them do that is quite an extraordinary thing. So I'm, I'm very interested, number one, in, in um, keeping a healthy uh, wolf population in the state of Oregon. And as one of the other people said, I'm very proud of Oregon's fantastic uh, health of wildlife and want to support that. Today I just want to speak specifically about pack structure and the way the animals communicate with each other to take um, their, their livelihood from wild populations of deer and elk and other small animals. Um, um, my husband, I, I don't eat so much meat. My husband is a meat eater and so I strive to find livestock owners uh, who use non-lethal methods only. And I interview the people where I buy my beef for my husband very specifically only to buy our meat and beef from people who are pro-wolf. And um, I think that the, it concerns me so much, this ongoing conflict between, supposed conflict between livestock owners and, um, uh, and the, the natural um, rightful um, existence of the wolf as a predator in our ecosystems. And I think that science gives us the clear roadmap towards a harmony if we just listen to that science. There's a lot of science out there now that proves that um, wolves are not responsible for the decline in deer and elk populations, that that is um, more tied to the destruction of habitat. 
There is now new science that shows very clearly that when you destroy a pack structure, you lead, that leads to more predation of livestock. And so it would be imperative that this plan is supporting the maintaining of healthy pack entities, families. A friend of mine, a Nez Perce friend of mine, Jean Half Moon, said to me years ago that when she was taken from her grandparents and forced to go to a BIA boarding school and for the first time read Little Red Riding Hood, she said, no, that's not the way they are. They are like we are. They live together in families and they take care of each other. And so that, again, shows this importance of the pack structure. And so I oppose in the plan anything that would deputize private citizens to become hunters or trappers of wolves. I can't even abide by the idea of trapping of wolves because I feel it's extremely cruel and nonspecific. And specific is the point here that this plan should just give the power for any kind of lethal uh, taking of a wolf only to ODF and W wildlife biologists, because these people are trained to figure out what wolf, if a wolf is a difficulty or problem, what wolf it is, and not to disturb the structure of the pack. So I think I'm just going to leave my comments at that. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Commissioners. All right, thank you, panel. Next up is Susan Prince. Susan here. And is there anyone who signed up whose name I didn't call? Okay. I guess I'll sit in the middle then. You can sit wherever you'd like, Susan. Your name and address for the record, please. My name is Susan Prince. I live in Sisters, Oregon. I want to start by reading you something really beautiful that was written two years before I was born in 1949. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then, and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. This was written by Aldo Leopold. He was the founder of the science of wildlife management that attempts to balance the needs of wildlife with the needs of people using the best available science. So I want to talk not about science right now, but about ethics. In Leopold's Pohl's vision of a land ethic, the relationships between people and land are intertwined. Care for people cannot be separated from care for the land. A land ethic is a moral code of conduct that grows out of these interconnected caring relationships. Ethics direct all members of a community to treat one another with respect for the mutual benefit of all. A land ethic expands the definition of community to include not only humans, but all of the other parts of the earth as well. Soils, waters, plants, and animals, or what Leopold called the land. We must not let wolves be hunted or trapped, especially by deputized citizens who most likely have a bias against wolves. They must be allowed to recover and to be managed by our wildlife agencies using the best available science. My concern is that if this isn't done, that wolf that died in the stream in front of Mr. Leopold will be representative of all the wolves and they will go extinct because that's what we do. We're doing it all the time, all over the planet, every minute. We're killing things without realizing what we've done until it's too late. So Oregon has a chance, the United States has a chance with these wolves to allow them to recover, to honor the ecosystem they're a part of, 
and to not kill them all because we can't go back once they're all gone. So I speak today not just for the wolves but for the whole the whole system because it's their keystone piece and it's we need it too. We all need it. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Commissioners? Okay. Thank you. All right, that concludes our public testimony. Derek? Back up. Commissioners, I'd like you um, to think about what uh, aspects of the testimony you've heard today that you would like to bring up and discuss. For example, I just wrote down the numbers, the designation of chronic, currently two and nine. In practice, we were doing three and nine. So there are some options. So give me something or think about it. If you don't have anything, that's fine too. That would represent something that as a commission we should talk about. It may result in an amendment, may not, but at least we talk about it. I'd, I'd also be able to, would like to put on the table if there were things earlier in Derek's testimony that we didn't have to interrupt him to bring up. But we, in other words, we made notes. Sure. You know, previously, I mean, it's still an opportunity. It's, it's not just what we want change in the plan, but if there's something unclear in the plan that we didn't, didn't bring up earlier, it's still like the opportunity to do so. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Commissioner Buckmaster. I might suggest that we go through the commission asking for general comments and, and questions first uh, to put things on the table and what we might want to address more fully as we That was my intent when I gave you my example. So I'll start down at the end. Rob? I guess uh, nothing right now. I'd like to hear the responses. Okay, fair enough. Wow. Some of us has been at this longer than others, so that's fair enough. Yeah, I've been fairly new to the process here. If it's the only full issue. Yeah. Commissioner Wall. Yeah, there were f um, four things that I would mention, including the one you already did. So three others that I can think of right now. Um, early on, Commissioner Buckmaster said something about maybe polling the group on the discussion we had about non-lethal, and that would be maybe a place to start. And I would appreciate having that conversation. Um, also, controlled take. Um, Non-lethal, which we would get to in the poll, but I think there were also some, some additional questions about what we could do with that. So those are the ones that come immediately to my mind. Okay, so you said four, including the one I mentioned. I wrote down non-lethal and controlled take. Was there another one I missed? The poll. Oh, the poll. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bill. There seems to be a big concern on the two depredations in a nine month period. Okay. We probably should look at that pretty hard. All right. Mr. Buckmaster. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, certainly I would like to spend more time and talk about the potential for, for beginning of uh, the beginning phase of establishing a pilot project moving forward with to address non-lethal uh, training, new ideas, keeping up to speed on that. I've talked to staff about it. I've talked to the governor's office uh, saying that I intended to do that. And did they have any problem with it? Maybe looking for additional uh, funding, but so that's high on my list. I would like, I have a suggestion on the compensation that I would like to present to the, at some point present to the uh, commission, the full commission. And just a, just a kind of an observation. That is, I listened to the testimony and it was excellent uh, across the board. Uh, I was struck by how many times we were presented with a, a binary choice on approving the wolf plan 
was somehow uh, going to injure the number or reduce the number of wolves we have, which is clearly not the intent, and, and nor was there uh, any particular uh, uh, evidence offered. I mean, there were phrases like wiping out wolves, but this, this plan has nothing to do with wiping out wolves. Or Then, then I, I saw that there was a comment uh, in uh, Advocate Weiss's uh, testimony that says the North American model for wildlife management is fundamentally flawed. Now, it may be true. I'm not going to argue that, but that is a discussion that this commission and other commissions around America are going to have to have as they look, at, look forward. But to interject that particular discussion into this decision at this point in, uh, in the decision-making process is, uh, I, I think, problematic, and, and we can't do it. Uh, we, so there is not, if you're anti-hunting, you're anti-hunting, and I'm, I, that's a discussion to have. But when we start talking about controlled take, and I, this is a question to Derek, whether or not the take is accomplished by ODFW staff or an agent, is, is there any difference in the number of wolves that would be removed? Uh, does it have any impact on the population, overall population of wolves? Depending upon how we des who we designate to uh, remove the wolves, and if it doesn't, then the question the question just becomes a a uh, more of a philosophical uh, debate rather than whether or not this plan changes by by how we uh, who we designate. So. So those are just comments that I'd make as far as listening to the, the testimony. Mr. Woolley. Uh, well, before I pinpoint specific things, just a general curiosity that came to me as we've been listening to people uh, during the day. Um, the number of people had talked about the plan uh, not being completely, the plan not being por perfect, but being very supportive of the plan. And then there are others that are 100% against the plan. And the folks that support the plan in its imperfection are the ranchers and hunters and agricultural folks. And the folks that are 100% against the plan are wolf advocates and you know, folks that are striving for a more strongly ecological approach. And yet, we call the plan a compromise. And so I don't think that's the definition of a compromise. When you have one side of an issue 100% for it, with the understanding that it has some flaws, and, and another side 100% against it, and so, but somehow we're saying we're, we're going down the middle and making a compromise. I'm just putting that out there as something to, to kind of wonder about because it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. Um, in terms of specific things, um, I think that I agree that we need to address the definition of chronic. I'm, I'm still having a little <coughs> lack of understanding um, Deputy D Director Hearn mentioned that, you know, this, this 2 and 9 was something that kind of came along from the beginning, but it's being that's being called a compromise. And, and so I'm trying to understand what was the other, what was the extreme beyond that in order for 2 and 9 to be somewhere in the middle? I'm not, did we go for 1 at one point or what? So I, I still don't understand that, but that, that can go in the discussion. And um, Chair Finley already brought that up as a topic. Um, So there is a, a point here that where o, ODFW designates 
a lethal control permit area and a an area of depredating wolves. And I I don't know what the the definition of an area is. And I, and I used to think that it meant that it that it was multiple depredations on one ranch. But now we're we're talking about an area. And I don't know what an area means. So I'd like to, to bring that up in the discussion uh, about chronic depredation um, as, as we go along. Um, I think we've already mentioned, or we've heard a lot about concerns of non-ODFNW uh, staff taking responsibility for either uh, identifying if the depredation is attributed to a wolf and passing that information on to our headquarters, or uh, being allowed to go out and kill wolves. And, and concerns specifically about wildlife services, and so I, I would like for us to have uh, some discussion about that. Uh, and then also, um, and, and Derek, we had this conversation before because because we've gone through uh, example after example after example of research that's been done uh, regarding the the attribution of of declined bungulates to wolves and I haven't been able to find a, a single example in the conclusions of all of the studies that you and your staff bring up that attributes wolves as a prime reason for, for ungulate decline. There there are a lot of multiple factors and so you know, the, the plan isn't isn't making any recommendations around that. I mean, I think you've done a good job to un to underscore the uncertainty and and the lack of, of conclusion with that. And I'm glad that that's in the plan. It's not drawing any conclusion about the impact of wolves in, in any kind of sus uh, substantial way. Um, I also want to have. I would like to have a discussion about the inclusion of, of some of the new, the newer uh, methods and trainings, methodology around around non-lethal take and, and the trainings that have occurred around the state that have been very well attended by ranchers. I appreciate that the ranch community has had an open mind. I, I feel that they're very solution oriented and, and want to hear about these methods. Um, I, I would like a discussion of, of what it potentially there can be some inclusion of the plan of, of at least mentioning uh, these methods in addition to all the other non-lethal methods that are uh, that are listed uh, in the plan. I, I think that's that's the bulk of my concern. I know that some of that is redundant of what's already said, but that those are things that are important to me. Okay, Mr. Atkinson. <coughs> well, I want to thank everybody who did. Um, present their thoughts and their views today. Um, we've had a lot of um, public testimony over the years and, and it's important that we hear from everyone. Um, that said, um, this draft of the plan has primarily been adapted based on the long-term um, comments that we have heard from the public and most recently the facilitated stakeholder groups um, that presented their perspectives from both sides and tried to come to some consensus. Um, ODFW at some point maybe had to say, well, this is sort of in between what each side wanted because neither of them liked what we presented. Um, so I feel like this update of the plan is in its final form, if not almost final form, um, because it was driven by stakeholder interests. Um, the one thing I would like to add is this addendum number one to exhibit two. Um, this was the piece that added the language that said, use of controlled take as a management tool requires commission approval through a separate public rulemaking process. And this is just a clarification to assure the public that something's not gonna happen while you're not paying attention and all of a sudden there's hunting of wolves in Oregon. 
Um, this is very carefully controlled process and you will be involved if and when any type of hunting or controlled take is proposed. So I feel like that's a good addition um, to at least let people know that is an intent and that's going to happen, that uh, nothing's going to happen without your involvement. So while we're there, um, you raise a good point. Have you all seen the uh, addendum? Have you all had a chance to read it? Now we can debate specifically of it, but are, are you comfortable the way this reads? Commissioner Willie. My concern is larger than an amendment. Um, my concern is about relationships. And I don't, it, no, I don't know if it's the time to talk about that now or we can talk about that later. Um, but the fact that, that hunting is being mentioned in this plan, even though our director's been, been very clear that there is not an intention by the department to institute hunting, is, is a huge thorn. And last year we lost a lot of goodwill because the Marble Murla issue was a disaster. And I feel that we could gain some, some goodwill. We need to be able to work with everybody in the future. Um, we know that the demographics of the state are changing. I appreciate that uh, the gentleman from Lake Oswego kind of highlighted that this is, this is 2019. We get a lot of reference to the 2005 plan, and this is 15 years later. And so populations shift, values shift. We know that hunting and angling has been going down in our state and nationally, d despite our department's efforts to reach out to get more young people involved in hunting and, and angling. Uh, we know that the people of Oregon want to recreate in a, a lot of different ways, and, and we're struggling to, to meet those kinds of demands, as well as our historic and traditional heritage obligations to hunters and anglers and, and even to trappers. Um, and so my, my concern is that, you know, there are certain elements in the plan that are causing a, a lot of consternation. We have our congressmen, we have our, our governor who has concerns about certain elements of this plan, and they represent every single person in this state. They're not just representing certain interest groups or certain industries. They're representing the, you know, the 80% of the people that are brought up, 75% of the people that are against certain elements of this plan. Um, and so the thing is, as a commission, at any point, we can decide if we want to have a controlled take or you know, change a rule to institute hunting at some point in the future. But the fact that it's in the plan is, is a big pain for a lot, for most people in the state. And it doesn't have to be there in order for us to take action in the future. And, and I think if we want to focus on better relations in the future, I think that there are some things that we can do in this plan or omit certain things in this plan that, do, that does not compromise our ability to make changes in the future, but builds a lot of goodwill with people of Oregon and a lot of these groups that now are feeling like they have no alternative except to sue us. And I mean, that, that's no way to develop relationships because we need to work together. We've had a lot of long-term, multi-decade relationships with, with the agricultural community, the hunting community, livestock and ranchers. And we need to continue to keep strong relationships there. 
And there are a lot of other organizations that have felt very marginalized. And we need everybody at the table. And so, not to ramble, which I, I may be, and I apologize for that, I think that there's some things that we can do in terms of addressing, we've heard the preponderance of testimony that we shouldn't have other people outside of our agency killing wolves or making decisions about whether a kill it has, was caused by a wolf or not. I understand that the department has, has constraints, uh, the, the packs are spreading, it, it's very difficult to have enough personnel on hand to make these designations, but I think that we need to listen uh, to everybody. Be and if we don't, we're just going to continue to have more and more conflict. And it's no fun, you know, for us or for, for anybody. So I, that's a long way of saying, yes, I see the amendment. I appreciate it, and I don't think that that it's necessary. I, I think that we just need to take parts of that section of the plan out. And because we have the ability to do this at any point, and, and if it's such a bone of condition and it's causing us issues and problems year over year, why have it in there if we don't need it in there? Well, I think we need it in there. And what this is is a clarification. Remember, we spent 20 minutes and we couldn't describe this among ourselves because the communication was incomplete. That's all this is to address, is the clarify the intent. I get, the, I get your point. And I'm saying that I'm saying the intent is causing a lot of problems. Well, we'll vote on it and then we'll solve it. Pardon? We'll vote on it and we'll solve it. Yeah. Mary? Go ahead. Well, you can go ahead. No, no. Okay. okay. Um, you asked if we were comfortable with it, Mr. Chair, and I am comfortable that this describes the situation we're in, that if we did, if we agreed to control take or a controlled hunt as a subset of that, it would need a, a commission um, process, and that's what this says. And so this is accurate language that could go in the plan. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what Commissioner Woolley is saying, and there were a couple points that I would make to add to this. One of them is um, I have enormous concern for the losses to ranchers. It's where I came from. It's what I know. Um, and I, I have seen those things up front. My experience is with coyote and, um, and with, with elk damage, but the but I have seen the, the coyote damage as well, not wolves, but coyotes. Um, so I support, I continue to support the ranchers and the grazers having the ability, as is outlined in the plan, to do lethal kills. Um, I agree with Commissioner Woolley that it, it's causing enormous consternation to have controlled take in the plan and the idea of hunting. And I think it's a bit of a distraction. I agree with people who have said, we have wolves on the landscape and that's important and it's a great achievement. Um, but I, I think that we could go into this next five years with a more solid plan if we were focused on non-lethal. That's why I would like to get back to this poll discussion and look at non-lethal. So that's where I'm ending up. Um, the one other thing I would like to say since I have the floor for just a minute is it's occurred to me a million times in the course of the last day that, or this whole day and my um, conversations with others that if you want to see democracy in action, this is sort of it. If you want to put together, um, if you want to see democracy, then you should be assigned the job of trying to write a plan with layers and players as complex as this one is, and so it's messy. But this is an important moment, I think, for the state. And so even with my enormous um, concern about the ranchers, and we'll get to that when we talk about compensation and incentives and that sort of thing, I would look to control take as a giant distraction, and we're better served without that in the plan. Derek, you heard that discussion. Where in the plan does it propose hunting? I thought it directly said we aren't going to engage in hunting. 
Chair Finley, um, in the rules under phase three, um, it states that the commission um, will essentially can authorize controlled take of wolves by special permit in um, specific areas to address long-term long recurring livestock conflict or under the population objectives or herd management goals um, not being reached. So, But that's not a public hunting program. So, and that's what makes some of this such an issue is you kind of have to step through where these definitions and where things fall. So controlled take is mentioned in the rule. And then in the plan, controlled take is defined in the glossary. And that's one of the main reasons why we adopt our glossary in addition to the bulk of the body of the plan because it's there that these terms have very specific meanings. Um, even, um, well, there's a number of concepts that we, it was necessary even for that very first group to define because they have their own criteria associated with it. So control take is identified in rule and it's defined in the glossary. The current proposed language, just, which doesn't vary much from the original, just has more detail, states the commission approved action for wolf population management that allows members of the public or tribes to kill a wolf by special permit to address long-term recurring wolf livestock conflicts, ungulate population objectives, or winter range or feeding area objectives. So their controlled take is the authorized use of the public hunters and trappers to take a wolf under certain criteria, certain circumstances. Then the body of the plan has gone on to say, okay, what are those specific criteria? What's on Don't the table? Say what's off the table? hunters and trappers. Is it say in that in that glossary? Uh, it says just special permit. Yeah, that allows members of the public or tribes to kill a wolf by special permit. And we had this issue during the phone call of the word or the term special permit versus permit. Um, and so. There's the definition of control take, which more or less, for, for the sake of discussion, it's the use of the public for the lethal take under specific criteria. Then it's in the body of the plan that defines what's on the table, what's off the table. And as Commissioner Akinson pointed out earlier, the plan explicitly states that hunters and trappers will be allowed, but it specifies that general season hunts are not allowed, general season. Uh, again, if, if the original language was for no hunting, it would say no hunting, but it excludes general season hunting. In this plan update, we heard that confusion. We heard the, well, that means no hunting, and we had to clarify, especially for people not familiar with the types of hunts and structure and process, what that means. So general seasons are excluded, but controlled hunts, and we provide the definition, go into detail on that, um, those are indeed allowed and would that would consist of a separate rulemaking process. So I apologize for I wish my answer was much much quicker but that's kind of how things are nested and where those criteria come from. Commissioner Buckmaster. Well during the conference call I told you I didn't like using the same language for these uh, controlled take controlled hunt that we use for hunting same terminology that it was going to cause uh, mass confusion and a problem and uh, anytime we have to say for discussion purposes when we're describing a plan we're in trouble uh, it has to be it has to be clear so I don't know at this late date that we can make changes but uh, in, in language but uh, we, we can but we uh, I like, I like the, uh, I think what we've done with the addendum is the right direction. Uh, it, with your permission, Chair, I would like to comment uh, on uh, my colleague, Commissioner Woolley's question about compromise somehow uh, inferring that because one side is adamantly opposed and the other side is supportive with reservations that it somehow uh, denotes that there is, there's, that, that is not a compromise, if I characterize that correctly. Um, compromise, for me, has always been that both sides are giving something up. And that uh, what, uh, what, ha how have they come to the middle? Um, 
certainly the original plan in 2005 seemed like a compromise, that people compromised on issues regarding TAG, regarding uh, uh, predation. And you saw that both sides gave stuff up. Now we see that uh, the uh, one side has said we're, we're willing to give up. We pay the lion's share. We do the feeding. We do this. We do that. And the other side is, my question is, what have they given up? So I think it is, if one side is giving something up, that it is A, clearly a compromise, and B, a one-sided compromise on the side that is moderately supporting it, the plan, rather than the side who has given nothing up. And, uh, uh, or, or as far as from their original position. Well, from the position uh, of they stayed with, stayed strong and only on their position from the, from the original, from what was agreed to. So I think there's a, I think the idea that there is no compromise is wrong. But, but just to, since we're having a discussion here, I would say that there was a compromise initially to have this phase three, you know, for those that don't want wolves to, that don't want control take, and that don't want to have the door open to hunting in the future, I think that originally incorporating those into phase three was probably a compromise for some folks. I, frankly, I would agree with that, and that's still the way it is. That hasn't changed. So the compromise that was in place is in place, and one side has stayed consistent with their support with reservations, and the other side has said, oh, I compromised there, and I'm not willing to compromise past this. Now, with, and I think uh, uh, Advocate Weiss made the, the, clearly that there had been some changes so that it's not apples to apples from 2005, and I acknowledge that. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with Commissioner Aikinson. I think, I think it's amazing that before wolves even arrived in, in the state, that they're, you could call these the founding fathers and founding sisters of, of this plan, were able to make these projections that have been very accurate 15 years later. I think, I think that's a huge compliment to them. And I don't know how much that public opinion was being pulled in 2005, and 15 years have passed. And we didn't have our, our public officials that represent us within the state and re represent us nationally having, showing the same levels of concerns uh, that they do now. And, and so I think that, you know, we keep referring back to 2005, and, and we're in 2019. And I think that some things have changed. And I, I think that we need to take that in consideration and not, not be locked in. You look at, look at the Constitution of the United States, there have been a lot of, a lot of amendments since 1776. And so um, that, that have supported the rights of people over time. And so we don't have to be locked in to, to every aspect of 2005. We're, we're in 2019, and we have the ability to make changes if we want to. All right, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back and do business. Did you? Did you?